would be great. Yes, I will try to speak a bit louder. Okay, that's good. That's great. Thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, so hope everybody everybody is uh, able to listen us. Hi, I'm I'm Harmish and I'm joined by uh, Max. Um, we will show you what is animotics, what is our animal uh, robot, and um, at the start I will show you some some uh, marketing videos also to get to uh, get to for you to get to know the animal C and um, some some of its uh, sensing capabilities and later uh, Max will take over and uh, he will show you more about how we use ROS and also how ROS uses our uh, software development infrastructure in general. Um, you can ask question I think at any time just unmute if you or you put it in chat and we will uh, check it later. Okay, let me start by showing you a, a very cool video of animal. I will just start and let you enjoy. This is the animal. To the untrained eye, it may look like a robot, and that's because it is. But it's no ordinary robot, it's an animal. This animal has just enjoyed an underwater excursion, because it can. The animal is the only robot of its species to be completely waterproof. For robots in Switzerland, it's regeneration season. Animals use 3D lasers to scan its environment for the perfect place to rest. Most species hibernate for the entire season. Animals complete their battery cycle in only three hours. Now that our animal has had its power nap, it's ready to go back to doing whatever its programmer tells it to. Comfortable in any habitat, the animal can go anywhere. Anybotics. Let robots go anywhere. This video broke. Yeah. I hope you are able to able to see and, and listen. Uh, and I hope I also that uh, it made you wake up. Um, so uh, let me start a bit with uh, the, the reasoning behind finding the company and politics. Uh, we saw that in, in 1980s, around when the robots were first um, uh, being used in industry, they were rather stationary. So uh, you put a kind of a cage for the robot uh, so that nobody can go there uh, and robot just keeps working. And, and uh, car manufacturing industry uh, uses uh, a lot of uh, such kind of robot. Uh, then, then a decade ago, the robots finally uh, developed the uh, mobility capabilities uh, using um, sensors like LiDAR scanners and, and cameras. And they get out of this cage and uh, they, get, they were usable in, uh, in uh, human environments. However, um, uh, most of the robots were with wheels and um, you need to, in that sense, adapt the environment for such robots. Uh, the next wave or the next generation of the robots we think would be um, they can just move as humans, so they will be uh, with legs uh, and also greater autonomy, uh, mobility, same as the robots we've seen uh, before. So you don't need to adapt um, uh, your uh, environment anymore. Uh, and yeah, animal, uh, Anibotics is, uh, is betting on this uh, future. You have seen our several motors. Uh, let's how we go anywhere. Um, in this slide, we just wanted to show that it's um, how such kind of an animal robot can be useful uh, in industry. Um, for us, it's uh, uh, mainly about the environments which are either dangerous or dirty, uh, where the robots uh, can be useful. So they, they will increase the safety because humans don't need to go into this, uh, these areas. Um, they can work repetitively, so it also uh, will increase the quality and quantity of the data they can collect. And then this data will be uh, given back to the operator, and then operator can be uh, can use their time more uh, for fixing stuff and required in, in, a, power, in a plant like this, which I'm showing, it's a, uh, it's a resemblance of a chemical plant. Um, we already um, 
So you're going to also show another, uh, see another video where we deploy a robot for a proof of concept study in a construction industry. I will also let you enjoy this video. Digitalisation, pour nous, intervient vraiment à chaque étape du projet. La sécurité, on ne peut pas faire des contrôles naturellement, mais on ne peut pas vraiment tout surveiller H24 de ce qui se passe vraiment sur le chantier. Et on a vu l'intérêt de ce robot à se comme relais de nos collaborateurs, de notre service prévention, pour justement nous apporter des informations de ce qui se passe sur le chantier, les petits écarts, et qu'on puisse directement les corriger. Et on s'aperçoit que de nombreux accidents euh, bêtement arrivent à cause de matériaux, matériel qui reste euh, au sol sur les cheminements euh, piétons. Jeder vierte Unfall in der Schweiz ist eine Stolperfalle. Wir sind als Losinger Marazzi bekannt für unsere Arbeitssicherheit. Das ist unser größtes Credo. Wir sind auch in den letzten Jahren einige Male mit dem SUVA-Preis ausgezeichnet worden. Unser größtes Ziel ist, dass jeder Mitarbeiter auf der Baustelle sicher und gesund am Ende des Tages zu der Familie nach Hause kommen kann. Au-delà de la sécurité, le robot aussi pourrait nous apporter un contrôle qualité. Le robot pourrait aller dans chaque pièce ou à différentes étapes du projet, simplement pour photographier des points critiques lors de la construction. J'y vois aussi un autre intérêt, c'est la, la rapidité avec laquelle on pourrait avoir l'information. La nuit, le chantier, normalement, on n'a pas de bruit. Un, les bruits viennent souvent, par exemple, d'un petit dégât des eaux ou un robinet qui fuit. On pourrait directement avoir la mesure du robot et il pourrait directement euh, appeler un service de surveillance qui pourrait venir se déplacer et directement intervenir. Spannend, nochmal wieder ein neues Projekt, eine neue Innovation, die Losinger Marazzi ausprobiert. Okay, I will stop the video over here because it has already introduced you to the most of the capabilities of, of animals. Um, just before I show you what are the sensors that enable such capabilities, I, I want to also um, show you a bit of a history. So uh, the animal robot was, a, was not like a one of the shot, it was developed for uh, about more than 11 years now. Um, it started for, at, at ETH lab as well, uh, the first robot Allo, um, and then it uh, gradually improved its capability with uh, Stahl, uh, Stahl ETH, and then Animal Alp. And finally, um, uh, in 2017, uh, the Animal Bat was capable. Uh, we added additional sensors that you can, you can see here, and this was used in a, uh, competition in oil and gas industry uh, as a demonstrator robot and there we saw the potential of such technology in industry and this is how the company Anipotics was uh, founded. Uh, we started with Animal B and in 2019 then we released a much more uh, rugged and industrialized uh, design. Uh, we call it Animal C as you can see here. So let me quickly go through what are the um, capab capabilities of the Animal C. Um, as, you can, as you can read here, it uh, can go at the maximum speed of one meter per second. It's of course omnidirectional. Um, it can adapt to any kind of environments, uh, stairs, slopes. Um, and because of its uh, rich uh, sensing capabilities, it can also avoid obstacles um, and pass through narrow corridors. So um, there are three ways, uh, generally, or three layers, three steps, you can say, how we use this robot. Uh, one is you can use it completely teleoperated. We will show you later. We have a industry uh, kind of a joystick with which you can control the robot. Um, you can also use it in supervised uh, way. You just give a point for the robot to go and it will uh, figure its path and go over there. However, what we are aiming for is a full uh, autonomous mode. So when we sell the robots, it's usually uh, the full autonomous capabilities where you can program a mission and the robot just keeps uh, repeating that mission over and over again. Um, yeah, so uh, it has a 360 degree um, cameras all around it. Um, four of them basically combine and give you a, a 360 degree, degree view. Um, then we also have a, a LiDAR sensor. Uh, this is used for even uh, far, uh, detecting farther obstacles and also to localize robot uh, in its uh, environment. Um, we also have uh, wide-angle cameras in front and back. They are uh, mainly used for teleoperation as well as um, 
a new capability, uh, which where we can where you can use the cameras for localization as well. Um, of course, you can if you are outdoors, you can also use uh, GPS to improve the localization accuracy. And uh, finally, um, for making it useful for inspection industry, uh, we developed this um, uh, inspection payload, what we call. Um, generally, animal is capable of carrying up to 10 kg of payload with any kind of a sensors you, you want to edit. Um, however, we give, uh, we already developed in-house uh, a sensor with um, thermal camera, zoom camera, and handheld uh, unit. Um, it has uh, three computers on board to, to enable locomotion, navigation, and also uh, other applications for citizen uh, inspection. Um, um, it has a, a standard connections such as uh, USB and Ethernet, so you, you can use any uh, sensing system which uses such um, co connections. And now I think <laughs> important to you is uh, all of our uh, computers talking to each other using the um, ROS communication layer. Uh, and now I will give it to Max to show you how we use ROS in animal. We will just switch. Thank you very much, Harish. Um, now we're coming to the, to the software part of, of ROS. And I will tell you first uh, what major tools we use from the ROS environment. And then also I will talk a bit more on how the software actually then looks like. Also, what is the software architecture um, inside ROS, uh, inside our animal, sorry. Um, first of all, uh, I want to give like a rough uh, system overview. Um, the robot, um, Animal C that we have, contains three different uh, computers uh, indicated with these uh, white blocks here. And to these different uh, computers, we attach different drives or sensors. And the first one we call is, uh, is the locomotion PC. Um, it does all the walking related real time uh, capabilities. Then the second computer, the navigation computer, um, will run missions and do navigation tasks uh, such as localization and walking around obstacles. Um, these two computers would make a fully autonomous robot already. Um, but for customers and for our uh, use cases, we have a third computer which we call the application PC. On this PC, we add all the, the inspection related sensors that we require in our missions in order to also like bring value to the customers. And now I think like since you had this ROS course, I think it's it's quite obvious of how you should use ROS in this environment, right? It's it's in a, a distributed system um, where you want data to flow between each other and you want to visualize it, you want to interact with the computers. And ROS here is a really big key enabler um, that helps us to actually develop such a machine and make it autonomous in the end. Um, and of course, like you also need an operator PC, which you will also see later um, to interact with the robot for Wi-Fi and the remote control. Then on a high level, what, what tools we will really use quite often um, is Arvis. It's the visualization tool of um, uh, ROS. Uh, you can visualize point clouds, all of that. Then RQT uh, helps you um, combine different GUIs into one, and we also make heavy use of that. And then when we want to only work uh, in simulation, uh, we use Gazebo. So all of these tools are open source and available from, uh, from ROS. And this is then how it looks like. On the left side, you see our uh, RQT uh, configured uh, system. Uh, with Arvis in the middle and extra information all on the side. And on the right side, you see the gazebo uh, simulation um, that gives us a uh, physical simulation. The cool thing we like about ROS is that you can then seamlessly go into the real world and say, okay, uh, now instead of gazebo, we have the real robot. And, and uh, if you interact with the robot, it still looks the, uh, looks the same. So the transition from working in simulation to the real robot is really seamless. And also when you write code, it always has to work the same way in Gazebo and 
on the real world. So it's not allowed that it only works on the real robot or in the, in, in, in the simulator. And then another nice feature from the ROS environment are ROS specs. So with ROS specs, you can record any sensor data or drive data that you're interested in. And then later offline, you can replay it. And we use that heavily for like debugging and tuning. And then again, it's the same interface as you could uh, imagine, but like here, I, we are replaying a data set from outdoor of our offices. Uh, you see on the top right, the output of the wide angle cameras and the point clients of the robot. I don't remember what I was uh, tuning there, uh, but I guess it was related to point clouds. Um, so all of these features uh, are really nice. We didn't have to develop them by ourselves. They really help us speed up bringing the algorithms onto the robot. And then if algorithms fail, quickly iterate on them and then improve them. And then as a last slide for this high level overview, um, we embrace cross agnostic design, meaning that uh, we split our software in, in a ROS wrapper and the core library. The core library then should be like an independent um, C++ software that you can compile uh, without the, the requirement of, of ROS. And why we decided to go for that is that um, ROS 1 might be or is uh, transferring to ROS 2. And, and with that, our transition is much more easier. And it's also more scalable to more different machines. And that's then how, how, how it looks like. So each of these cores couldn't communicate with all of the other systems, but the, the ROS wrapper around it enables us to communicate through the ROS network um, and to share data between each other. So navigation core, for instance, would require uh, results from the localization core. That concludes um, the most uh, the high level view of how we use ROS uh, on animal or at antibiotics. Um, we will go now through like more algorithm specific uh, features of animal, how we actually program animal. Um, and then I will also always relate it to, to, to ROS. The one, one important thing here is also um, to mention that uh, as Harnish already mentioned, so animal came out of the research community from the RSL lab. And they already started with this uh, ROS environment. And I personally think that it's quite nice to, to have this exchange. And also like if you define the ROS interface and you learn the ROS interfaces, you can quite easily pick up a new project. Okay. Um, on the locomotion computer, we have this um, real-time uh, feedback loop which is like the sense thing X cycle, which enables uh, walking of the robot. Um, you have different components. The first one is state estimation. So anyone that took uh, uh, control courses at ETH should be quite aware of this uh, uh, feedback loop. So you first have the estimation, uh, then you have full, full body control, then you send joint commands to the actuators, and then you will finally get a walking physical robot. And ROS here really helps us to uh, define the structure to not only have it like in one big CPP file, rather have like separate components really uh, with meaningful naming to, to understand what is going on in the code. I guess, as you can imagine, it requires quite a lot of software to have all of these capabilities working. And then if you look at just our, uh, practical examples that we're working on, um, it's just um, perceptive locomotion that also combines information from the navigation computer, transfers it to a locomotion computer such that um, visual information or depth information can be used to actually navigate above and around uh, obstacles uh, and to actively perceive the terrain. Then another thing um, that is worth looking at is um, learning 
which becomes more and more uh, uh, popular, popular in the control area. And here uh, we also got this from, from in collaboration with, with RSL uh, as a uh, fall recovery controller. So if the robot falls, it's actually, you can fall into quite a complicated configuration. So it's, it's a very random process. And we saw that uh, learning skills to actually stand up uh, improves or gives us a very robust controller. And then here again, also Ross helps us to learn first in simulation and then bring it on the, onto the real robot as you see on the right video. Then if we look more on the, what's happening in the, in the navigation computer, um, you can summarize it with this graph. So you have localization in a given map or you create a new map and then you do global navigation. This is required if you want to do autonomous missions. Otherwise, you will not be able to go from A to B. Then for all the things that happen around the robot, we have uh, near field perception, which we use most of the uh, depth sensors to also do then uh, local navigation. So for instance, if the robot wants to walk into a wall, it should not walk into a wall because the near field perception tells him there's a wall and you should not do it. So, um, one big part is uh, simultaneous localization mapping, short SLAM, and uh, we have a point class based SLAM, which means we use um, our LiDAR sensor on top of the robot and the depth sensors to create maps based only on, on point clouds, and then also localize within them. And here you see uh, our uh, office space. Um, this is actually where we sit now, I think, here. That's where we sit now. This is like our room. And I think that's, I think, big one kilometer or not, 800 meters. It's, it's quite a big area. Um, and then also we went to this test area at Bangen on the Aare and also created an even bigger map. And given that map, you can then uh, go from A, from A to B. Um, for the near field perception, we have this thing called train mapping, um, which in the end, at the moment, maps the height around the, the robot in a 2D grid, uh, which we call grid map. Here you see the examples. So from, from the from the RVs, this is then how it looks like. And based on the height values, motion controllers can adapt their gates and uh, control, control the robot and uh, be more adaptive to the terrain which in the end enables us to let the robot go really anywhere. And since this also came from RSL and uh, ROS in the end is actually also an open source software, these are two example packages that are also open source. So at this point, I would recommend to also check out our GitHub uh, page uh, because we have also other open source packages. And we saw or we see that like interacting with the community is a, is a big, big plus also. Uh, I think it's, for us, it's not only the, the, the software, the framework, it's also people that, that work with it. You can exchange ideas, you can improve software. Other people find bugs. That's also sometimes not straightforward. There are always edge cases in software that you might not find, but someone else finds. Then path planning and following. So as I uh, told you, once we have the map, uh, we can plan a path. So we have here at Hardenholz a uh, mini industrial setup that you see in this uh, video. And here the path planner would give like a global path to the goal that you see here. And then while executing and following uh, this path, it is able to walk around obstacles and not like, first of all, not walk into obstacles and then walk around obstacles. If we then go to the last computer, the application computer, um, we Max, have, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. You have a question one here related to the localization oh, in the chat. So do you want to answer it now or should we just do it at the end of the presentation? Uh, what's up the here. question about? Uh, do you see the chat or not? No, sorry. Uh, okay, then I'll just read it out loud. Oh. 
Sorry, no, I think I see it. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I think I can quickly answer this uh, uh, question. So, this is about like global localization. So, um, it, so it localizes within a, a given map. Um, you have to kind of tell the robot first uh, where it's standing. So you have to give like an initial, an initial guess uh, in order to converge to, to a solution and then it, it, it tracks uh, the position. And this is based then on the point cloud that you have. Uh, so basically it's reading the lighter and, and correlating that or, or comparing that to the map that you have. Sorry, can you repeat the question? So what I'm wondering is, uh, without using GPS, yeah, if you place your, your robot in, in any of these environments and you know this map, you have this map basically, yes. and you place it somewhere, can the robot, through using the LiDAR, the point cloud scan, localize itself inside the map? So what, what you have to do is you have to give an initial guess uh, where the robot roughly is. Uh, and then, given the map, it can localize uh, within this uh, point cloud. Yes, I mean that's the, the purpose of, of this lab system. Yes. Okay. Perfect. The, but but you mean like if, if if you can just place it anywhere and just start it and then uh, yes yes yeah. uh, currently not no um, so that that is just like how how the workflow at the moment works yes but it it's, it doesn't have global localization. But then you could uh, complement that with GPS and probably give yourself the like initial maybe to the initial guess. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's that's what you would do. Yeah. And then, as you saw, uh, yeah. Um, but the thing is, with GPS, like if, if you are indoors, it doesn't really help you much, right? Um, and I think also for our use case, uh, where we want to tackle um, industrial facilities. GPS might not always be given, right? I think it, it would be GPS is more useful for agricultural robotics, um, but I guess our robot sees many uh, areas where it doesn't have GPS. Is it okay if I continue? Yeah, yeah, perfect, thanks. Good. Okay, I will like the chat. Thank you for the question. You can just also ask more questions. Also then in the end, we will have a Q and A. Okay, so once, as we just said, like the robot is localized within this big map and we have navigation working, um, we also want to understand the environment. And this is like all the job of this application computer. So we have this um, visual camera to check wells and cages and to understand on what level it is. And we also have a, a thermal camera on the robot, uh, which is also a very uh, important information if you if you run a, a process or, or a, a company. So it's, it's a big indicator of like, if, is your machine running well or not? Is it overheating or not? And then also sound gives you also a lot of information about the health status on, of your company. And then in the end, like as you saw for Losiga and Marazzi, it's actually also interesting to directly get the point cloud maps, uh, maybe even denser versions uh, to monitor the environment, right? To maybe also like see the history, like what's already built and what is not built. Um, so in, in that sense, we really have a, a platform, or want to build a platform that is capable to do a lot of different things. Then, like all of the skills so far were, were uh, single skills. And then in the end, on the high level to really bring it all together, we have a mission framework um, where you can define uh, execution graphs. So for instance, a final mission on a customer would then look like this. So you, you start somewhere at your place X and you have to walk somewhere. During walking, you maybe have to cross uh, stairs. Then if you, you also have maybe obstacles, uh, so you, you act on it. And then if you reach your target destination, you will uh, inspect your point and upload it uh, to the server. And then you have like a full circle for the customer, like an autonomous inspection. 
what robotics here really helps is also what happens if something fails, right? Like uh, it walks, it bumps into a wall because for whatever reason the sensor is not working. And um, for that, as you also saw, we have uh, uh, these different skills to really have a robust machine and, and have operations on offshore platforms that don't require any human interaction. And combining all of this then um, really gives like us the autonomous machine that you really want and that we also sell. And after all of this work, of course, uh, he also has to recharge, which is like the last part of uh, making it autonomous. So once the battery runs low, it goes back and docks on this charging station and roughly charges for two hours and the mission can continue. The last part of the presentation is maybe not directly targeted to, to ROS, but since you program in ROS, uh, we, we think also it's, it's interesting for you to know. Um, if you write software for your own, um, you don't have to follow certain rules, but like if you're a bigger software team, there are rules that you should follow in order to not create a mess. And we would also like to share uh, our workflow with you. Um, first thing is the computer setup. Uh, it has to be consistent. So we always have one um, uh, operating system, which currently is, is Ubuntu 20, and uh, one uh, ROS version, which is uh, Nuitic. This already makes things much easier. And then to share code, uh, we internally use GitLab, and I, as, and as I mentioned before, uh, GitHub is used to interact with the open source community. Then um, a very interesting thing here in writing code is uh, our quality assurance. So here in the middle, you see a software developer uh, which commits code uh, onto GitLab or, or GitHub. No GitLab. On GitLab, um, we then run unit tests and ROS integration tests. So that's already like a first stage of quality assurance. And if these fail, uh, the user gets notified. He also gets notified if it doesn't fail. And it's like a first stage of, of, of quality testing to make sure that the software you want to merge into, into production code uh, doesn't break existing software. Then to further test it, we create every night uh, Debian packages or just software that you can easily download onto your robot. And then uh, we regularly um, test all of these new changes from nightly on the hardware directly. And we have a predefined mission uh, at Hagenholz um, where you have to test all the capabilities that uh, the robot needs to be able to do. And then for instance, if at one point this user break, doesn't break something here, but breaks something here, he also gets a notification and then he has to also fix it. Um, and this then makes it really easy to get stable software at the end, which can also can be forwarded to the, to the customers. Also, again, if you work together, you have to follow certain rules. We have these public uh, ROS best practices, C++ style guides. That's also all major uh, software companies like Google and Facebook have similar um, instructions. And then in the end, um, so we have industrial partners, but we also have uh, research partners. And we think that choosing ROS in this case for our platform really also helps uh, research partners all around the world to actually um, use our robot and do their own research because there's still a lot of things that you can uh, look into and improve and like maybe different uh, use cases more like rescue, uh, search and rescue, rescue, which we at the moment don't focus on. Um, you see a video here of Uh, from, from Oxford of a test uh, with uh, animal in a bunker, I think. And you can also get this video on YouTube. Um, is it search and rescue? Yeah. 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 So they, they are actually looking to search and rescue here. 
and then like also the the videos obviously or the visualization obviously is a created uh, created thanks to to Ross. Like that. So that concludes uh, our presentation. We will go now to Q and A. Um, Harnish will answer Q and A. I will also prepare the live robot he, he brought. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening at your interest. And one mention, uh, we always have uh, jobs open and we also have uh, software internships open. They are uh, very interesting. I can highly recommend those. <laughs> thank you. Yeah.